terror in the woods. Great concern caused by the deeds of a wild man. Unlucky lumbermen slain and their bodies mangled in a shocking manner. Bangor, Maine. A lumberman who returned today from the forests in the north of the state brings the most harrowing intelligence of the doings of a wild man in the lumber region of the West Branch. He states that great concern has been caused and a large number of lumbermen have left the camps and returned to their cities rather than face the monster. For over two months quite a number of men have disappeared from the camps and when found bore the semblance of having had an encounter with some wild animal their bodies in every instance having been terribly mangled and torn. A lumberman who returned to a camp a little north of the city a week ago startled all by stating that while at work he had been attacked by this wild man and it was only by the help of his axe that he had been able to defend himself from the murderous attacks. Since that time he has been seen by the crews several times but on their approach he the creature fled into the deep woods with the speed of a deer. He is described as being so nearly like an animal that it is almost impossible to detect him from one. He has a long shaggy beard and is covered with a huge skin coat. The general belief is that he is a sportsman who has become lost in the deep forests. After wandering around for weeks has gone hopelessly crazy and already there have been over half a dozen instances of a similar character in the state. The crews of the lumbering camps are out hunting for the man and hope by shooting him in the leg to affect his capture. A new kind of game. Waterville Sentinel, Maine. An unfrightened Frenchman from over the line has his fellows town all by the ears with a story of a gigantic wild man. Led a week or so ago in the dense woods above Moosehead, the Frenchman's story, which is implicitly believed, is that three men were camping out in the woods about a hundred miles north of Moosehead Lake. Two of the campers were away from the camp for a week and came back to find the dead of their companion they went for help and reinforced a dozen, dozen others searched the woods for the unknown murderer. It proved to be a terrible wild man, ten feet tall with arms seven feet in length, covered with long brown hair. The party took several shots into him and finally succeeded in reaching a fatal spot laying the monster low. The story has caused great excitement amongst the more ignorant portion of our foreign population. The Modesto Bee, Sunday, January the 20th, 1935. Wild man is said to rule unexplored empire. Anchorage, Alaska, January the 19th. Out of the isolated district north of Bristol Bay comes a tale of the wild man of Nushakuk, a nebulous terror jealously guarding an empire which, even on the larger maps, is an unexplored white patch with dotted lines for streams. Charles J. Dumble Bolton, sourdough prospector, of many years in the Yukon and Klondike Valley camps, told the story today after arriving by plane from a season of prospecting 125 miles from the nearest settlement. The wild man is believed in so firmly by the few men in the area that they have drawn a voluntary boundary to their northern trips and while he made no effort to investigate the wild man's authenticity, Dumble Bolton said he found trappers feared to venture beyond their own established frontier, the King Salmon River. He said the wild man, perhaps some creature crazed by loneliness, has been reported 
seen several times and is blamed for the disappearance of several men who have ventured into the region of the upper Nushakuk and its tributaries the past several seasons. The wild man's empire is a vast region between the south flowing upper Nushakuk and the westward flowing middle course of the Kushkanahus Nevada State Journal, Saturday, January the 4th, 1964. Hideous screams heard. Ape faced, ten foot tall man sighted in Sierra Snow. Pinecrest, California. United Press. A pilot flying a small plane near this tiny resort community recently said he saw what appeared to be a ten-foot man with an ape-like face standing in the snow watching the plane fly over. The pilot reported the incident which supposedly happened in the back country near Pinecrest to the sheriff's office in Saora, but deputies there would not release his name or elaborate on the report huge footprints. A broadcaster from a radio station in Siora said Friday he had talked to a sheriff's deputy stationed in Pinecrest and the deputy Albert Miller said he had been called out to the Pinecrest city dump late last week to investigate a set of huge footprints found in the snow. Miller said the prints were very large and about six feet apart. The deputy said they were definitely not bear tracks. Approximately a year ago, residents of the Pinecrest area reported hearing hideous screams coming from the woods near their homes and told of seeing a gigantic man dressed in animal hides running through the forest in the early evenings. Seen in the bushes about a month after the reports of the screaming a veteran backwoods pilot and a Pacific gas and electric employee on a snow survey near Pinecrest said that they saw the creature standing in some bushes in the wilderness. When they flew in at a low level to take a photograph, they said it ran into the woods. The two men estimated the creature to be about four feet taller than the foliage it was standing in, and they landed and measured them. The bushes were six feet tall. Sheriff Miller of Sonora said Friday he has no intention of sending deputies into the backwoods to search for the supposed monster. If and when he breaks the law, we'll go after him. As long as he doesn't do anything wrong, we'll leave him alone. The Whistling Wild Boy of the Woods Like a year ago, there was considerable talk about a strange animal said to have been seen in the southwestern part of Bridgewater. Although the individual who described the animal persisted in declaring that he had seen it and it was at first considerably frightened, the story was heard and looked upon more as food for the marvelings than as having any foundation in fact. He represented the animal as we have it through a third person as having the appearance of a child seven or eight years old, though somewhat slimmer and covered entirely with hair. He saw it while picking berries walking towards him erect and whistling like a person. After recovering from the fright he is said to have pursued it, but it ran off with such speed, whistling as it went, that he could not catch it. The same or similar looking animal was seen in Silver Lake Township about one week since by a boy some 16 years old. 
We have the story from the father of the boy in his absence, and afterwards from the boy himself. The boy was sent to work in the backwoods near the New York state line. He took with him a gun and was told by his father to shoot anything that he might see except persons or cattle. After working a while, he heard some person, a little brother as he supposed, coming towards him, whistling quite merrily. He came within a few rods of him and stopped. He said it looked like a human being, covered with black hair about the size of his brother, who was six or seven years old. His gun was some little distance off and he was very much frightened. He, however, got his gun and shot at the animal, but trembled so that he could not hold it still. The strange animal, just as his gun went off, stepped behind a tree and then ran off, whistling as before. The father said the boy came home very much frightened and that a number of times during the afternoon, when thinking about the animal he had seen, he would, to use his own words, burst out crying. Making due allowances for frights and consequent exaggeration, an animal of singular appearance has doubtless been seen. What it is, or whence it came, is of course yet a mystery. From the descriptions of an orangutan we're known to be in the court, we might think this to be it. As no such animal is known, without vouching for the correctness of the story, we shall leave the reader to conjecture, or guess for himself, what it is. For the sake of a name, however, we will call the strange animal the whistling boy of the wood. Horns Neville Tribune, Thursday morning, May 8th, 1856. The Wild Man Again. A correspondence of the Caddo Gazette, writing under date of the 28th from Perilous, Arkansas on Upper Red River, states that the coal during the present winter has been in that region the severest within the memory of man. The rivers were frozen solid. The plains presented an unbroken sheet of snow. The writer relates the following story of an attempt to capture the famous wild man, who has been so often encountered on the borders of Arkansas and northern Louisiana. In my travels I met a party from your country in pursuit of a wild man. They had struck his trail at a cane break bordering on Brant Lake and the Sandflowers Prairie. I learned from one of the party that the dogs ran him to an arm of the lake which was frozen, but not sufficiently strong to bear his weight which consequently gave way. He had, however, crossed, and the dogs were at fault. One of the party mounted on a fleet horse, coming up, encouraged the dogs to pursue, but found it impossible to cross with his horse, and concluded to follow the lake round until he could assert the direction taken by this monster of the forest. On reaching the opposite side of the bend, he was surprised to see something in the lake like a man breaking ice with his arms and hastened under cover of the undergrowth to a spot where he expected him to come out. He concealed himself near the place where he had full view of him until he reached the shore where he came out and shook himself. He represented him as a stout, athletic man, about six feet four inches in height, completely covered with hair, of a brownish cast about four to six inches long. He was well muscled and ran up the bank with the fleetness of a deer. He says he could have killed him with his gun, but 
the object of the party being to take him alive, and hearing the horns of his comrades and the howling of the dogs on the opposite bank of the lake, he concluded to ride up and head him, so as to bring him to bay and then secure their prize. So soon, however, as the wild man saw the rider, he rushed towards him and in an instant dragged the hunter to the ground and tore him in a most dreadful manner, scratching out one of his eyes and injuring the other so much that his comrades despair of the recovery of his sight, and biting large pieces out of his shoulder and various parts of his body. The monster then tore off the saddle and bridle from the horse and destroyed them, and holding the horse by the mane broke a short piece of sapling and mounting the animal started at full speed across the plains in the direction of the mountains, guiding his horse with his club. The person left with the wounded man informed me that the party was still in pursuit having been joined by a band of friendly Indians and thought that if they could find a place in the mountains not covered with snow or a cane break in the vicinity to feed their horses they might overtake him in a day or two. Great Chart A Mysterious Animal On Saturday evening week a person in the employ of Mr. E. Greenhill at Buxford Farm Great Chart was startled by the sudden apparition of what appeared to him to be an extraordinary kind of animal resembling a large baboon in one of his employees wheat fields but whose name and nature was utterly incomprehensible to him not knowing indeed whether it might be a certain unmentionable personage in bodily shape its appearance had the effort of utterly scattering his senses, and when he had collected enough of them to make up his mind to a speedy retreat, fear had so unnerved his limbs that he was at first unable to get over a stile which led out of the field. He, however, at last did so, and we may suppose reached his home with his hair standing on end, and related the tale of the awful Zummit he had seen but the shock was so great that it made him ill. On the affair becoming known, it is reported several of the stout men of great chart, well armed, made a search in the fields, but did not succeed in catching the animal, whatever it might be, while one party, probably inclining to the supposition of, quote, the thing, unquote, being his satanic majesty harbored thereabouts, took a horse and cart and went to Ashford in order to bring back aid from the police in taking him into custody. Since then it is reported that the animal, which is set down as a baboon escaped from some show, has been seen in several adjacent parasages, but we have not heard of its capture, or of any damage done by it, except indirectly through persons trampling down the wheat in Mr. Greenhill's field while in search of it. Greetings, my fellow Zenyetians. It is I, Michael Merchant, back with two vintage news reports for your consideration from the late 1800s. I would like you to take note of the similarities and the, the main difference is in, in this one, once again, the wild man, in quotations, is carrying a pole or a bludgeon. You almost never hear Bigfoot being reported to have a bludgeon. We see the red eyes, we see the consistent behavior and the overall size and outward descriptive appearance is almost exactly what we get nowadays. So... Listen to these, and then, you know, what do you guys think? Do you think the wild man was something different? Was Were these hermits living in the woods, like the people thought? Or is the wild man the same thing that we have today, but we call it Bigfoot? The Hagerstown Mail, Friday, May the 5th, 1871. 
The Tennessee Wild Man. The Jackson, Tennessee Whig of the 13th Instant says, quote, We learned that between Sauvy and Cranesville, on what is called Piney in McNary country, a strange and frightful being has been observed for several weeks. He is said to be seven feet high and possessed of great muscular power. His eyes are unusually large and fiery red. His hair hangs in a tangled and matted mass of jet below his waist, and his beard reaches below his middle. His entire body is covered with hair, and his whole aspect is most frightful. He shuns the sight of men, but approaches with wild and horrid screams of delight every woman who is unaccompanied by a man. He sometimes, with great caution, approaches houses, and should he see a man, he runs away with astonishing swiftness, leaping the tallest fences with the ease of a deer, defying alike the pursuit of men and dogs. He has frightened several women by attempting to carry them off, as well as by his horrid aspect, and the whole country around Sabi is in concern. The citizens are now scouring the woods and are determined either to capture or drive off the monster. The Atlanta Constitution, Atlanta, Georgia, Monday morning, February the 4th, 1889. A wild man in Walker. The wild man has again made his appearance. He was seen last week near High Point by a reliable gentleman who was searching along the spurs of Lookout Mountain for mineral indications. On arriving at the head of a hollow just above Mrs. Oliver's, his attention was attracted by a thrilling screams on the side of the high spur that he had just passed along the trail below. He looked in the direction from which the noise came. What should he see but the wild man? With his fright cooled down, he discovered that the old fellow was not making any move towards him, but was standing erect and shaking his fist at him and showing signs that were not favorable to a human being. Therefore, get away was thought about immediately, but before starting he thought he would examine the wild gentleman more minutely. He was about a hundred yards from him, but could distinctly see his teeth, nose, and eyes, and describes him thus. Was about seven, or seven and a half feet high, hairy as an old bear, and would weigh, from his looks, 400 pounds. Had a pole in one hand that looked to be 10 feet long, which he handled as easily as a stout, healthy man would a pipe stem. His name was asked, and the answer came in the shape of a large stone which weighed at least a hundred pounds, which was hurled at the inquisitive gentleman. This being done, there was no time left for any further inquiry. Consequently, he tried the working speed of his legs and feet, which worked most excellent, until he arrived at Frank Carter's shop almost breathless. As soon as he could narrate his story, a crowd was collected which started in search of the wild man of Lookout Mountain. Walker County Messenger Given the prolific nature of the news reports from, you know, the 1800s, this would appear to be a huge amount of favorable evidence to support this phenomenon just based on the similarities, and yet it seems to be grossly overlooked, just cast aside. Why is that? Zenyetians, seekers of truth, welcome to the Bigfoot Vault. Yes, it is I once again, Michael Merchant, with a treat to vintage stories from the crypt. The first report is from 1926 from the Modesto News Herald. It reads, Wild Man Raids Redlands Orchards. 
a wild man who has been terrorizing residents in the eastern outskirts of the city and who is said to be stealing his meals from peach and orange trees was still at large today. The marauder, who has been reported seen dodging among outlying orchards, was described in frantic calls to the police as having bushy whiskers and wearing massive wooden shoes. He is said to be of powerful build. Because of his whiskers, he looks like an old man, but says he runs like a deer when anyone calls him, a rancher reported. Aside from wearing massive wooden shoes, we have a pretty much classic Bigfoot encounter. You have to wonder if the massive wooden shoes, how did they determine that? Like, how did, I mean, that doesn't make any sense. Why would the guy have massive wooden shoes? Were the wooden shoes because he left giant footprints? Being of powerful build and being so fleet of foot that he can outrun a deer is classic big Bigfoot reports, but the, the wooden shoes, that's, that's unique. For our second story, we are going to head a bit north to Happy Camp, which today still gets Bigfoot reports. Now this is from 1886. Mr. Jack Dover, one of our most trustworthy citizens while hunting, saw an object standing 150 yards from him picking berries or tender shoots from the bushes. The thing was of gigantic size, about seven feet high, with a bulldog head, short ears, and long hair. It was also furnished with a beard and was free from hair on such parts of the body as is common among men. Its voice was shrill or soprano and very human, like that of a woman in great fear. Mr. Dover could not see its footprints as it walked on hot, hard soil. He aimed his gun at the animal, or whatever it is, several times, but because it was so human, he would not shoot. The range of this curiosity is between Marble Mountain and the vicinity of Happy Camp. A number of people have seen it, and all agree in the description, except that some make it taller than others. It is apparently herbivorous and makes winter quarters in some of the caves of Marble Mountain. Perhaps one of the number who saw that wild man will give us the story as it sticks in his mind. Was he seven feet tall and did he have the bulldog face? Might he have been another Ishini or what is the answer? In Del Norte, close to a half a century ago, he was real. Does anyone know more about this wild man? Is this the description of a Bigfoot? Or is this a dog man? Or is this a hybrid? He's describing a, a Bigfoot, except for the lack of hair and, you know, the bulldog face with a beard. Bizarre. The shrill soprano, very human voice, once again, this, this unique vocalization that we see associated with Bigfoot, we see being reported, you know, with these wild men. And Happy Camp and Marble Mountain are known hotbeds of modern Bigfoot activity. Apparently, it was a hotbed a hundred years ago for wild men. The news. Newport, Rhode Island, Wednesday, October the 8th, 1958. Giant Prince believed wild Indians. Seattle, Associated Press. A taxidermist says Bigfoot, the creature whose huge human-like footprints have the people of Wichita area of the Northern California guessing is an Indian gone wild. Al Corbett said he and another Seattle taxidermist, Bob Timmis, inspected the tracks 25 miles north of Wichpuk last Saturday and found the prints to be, quote, very large, definitely human tracks. Corbett said the clearest print was 16 inches long, 
five inches across at the heel and seven inches across at the ball of the foot. A logger in the area, Gerald Crew, last week brought out a plaster cast of a clear footprint. The story behind this is that there was a mentally deficient Indian boy who was kept chained by his parents, Corbett said. When this boy was 17 years old, 28 years ago, he broke the chains and disappeared. The Indians found his clothes but never saw him again. They said he had extremely large feet. We talked it over a great deal and figured this man now must be six feet seven inches to seven feet six inches tall. We thought he might weigh as much as four hundred pounds. He made firm footprints in hard ground. Measuring the footprints for a distance of more than sixty feet, we found the average stride was fifty inches. We checked this against the stride of a man six feet four inches tall with long legs and his stride was thirty inches. We were told by people who saw footprints made when this unknown man was running that they were ten feet apart. I know positively this is a human being. It seems logical that it is this Indian who disappeared and is living wild. He does his traveling at night. He's not molested anyone. We learned these tracks have been appearing for the past ten years. Good day. It is I, Michael Merchant, once again, with evidence from the Bigfoot vault, straight from the archives, for your consideration. Today we have a report from 1907, the Reno Evening Gazette. Wild man startles people of Kentucky. Hairy creature seen by farmhand, and both are so scared they prepare to run. Lexington, Kentucky. Information has been received here that the people in the county around Buena Vista, a village in Garrod County, are much excited over the reports that a wild man has his haunts in the Kentucky River Hills near that place. A party is being organized to explore a cave where the creature is believed to have his lair and attempt to capture him. Jim Peters, a farmhand employed by S.D. Scott, postmaster at Buena Vista, while working in Bowman's Woods near High Bridge, a short distance from Buena Vista, was attracted by the peculiar actions of his dog, which came running to him from a thicket nearby, yelping and showing every evidence of extreme fright. A moment later, Peter says, a creature with the shape of a human being followed the dog and approached within 20 yards of him. Peter says he was too frightened to run. The apparition kept its eyes on the dog until asked what it was doing there, when it turned and disappeared into the woods. Peter said the creature wore no clothes except a coonskin tied about its loins. Its long black hair streamed down its back and breast in a matted mass and covered the face so that he could not see whether it had a beard or not. Its body was covered with a coat of soft, fuzzy black hair, and its finger and toenails were long and curved like talons. Peters hurried home and told his employer, who today organized a party who went to where the wild man had been seen. They found no trace of him in the woods, but in the mud of the river bank, they found the tracks of bare human feet with claw-like toenails. Meanwhile, the women and children of the vicinity are afraid to leave their homes. The man is supposed to be an escaped prisoner or lunatic. Yeah, there's a couple things I find a little peculiar. One, that there's no mention of the 
of the size of this thing and it's interesting that they call it a wild man and then describe it as a hairy creature an apparition but yet the women and children believe that it's an escaped prisoner or a lunatic the other thing that's that's really curious is the coon skin loincloth what the hell <laughs> what's the deal with this coin we see this over and over again in these reports from you know the mid 1800s this is 19 1907 yeah 1907 i don't understand what's the deal? why is it always a coon skin it seems as if the wild man had a puritan streak in him i wonder if the editors are adding the coonskin or if somebody somewhere along the narrative is is adding it what do you guys think why is it that the wild man is often have is wearing this coonskin loin B bigfoot we almost never hear of anybody nowadays reporting sasquatch or bigfoot wearing any type of clothing why is that Leave your comments below and thanks for watching guys. Loggers swear they saw large Bigfoot in Sierra County, Sacramento. Three frightened loggers have filed a report with the Sierra County Sheriff's Department describing their encounter with a creature they said was Bigfoot. Claude Dunley, Tommy Ruffing, and Lance Janet the third literate loggers reported they were at a picnic area on Highway 88 between Truckee and Sierraville when they begin hearing screeching squawking noises at dusk Friday said Sergeant Joe Mosley several minutes later as they brewed coffee they saw what they described as an upright animal between nine and ten feet tall coming towards them. It was this large, hairy, burnt black animal walking on its hind legs, Mosley said, the trio told him. When it saw them, it ran away towards Posier Lake, knocking over a small tree in its path. About 400 feet separated the men from the creature, said Gary Horn, a California Fish and Game Department warden who conducted an investigation of the area Saturday. The men estimated that the animal moved with a five-foot stride, crossing Highway 89 in two steps. One guy told me, two strides was enough for me. I packed up my grub and got the hell out. The loggers drove directly to Sierraville where they reported the incident to Mosley. The site is in a remote area of California near the Nevada border. Those guys were stone cold sober. They were actually serious about this and so scared that they wouldn't go back up to the campground. They slept in their vehicles right in Sierraville, Mosley said. Mosley contacted Horn, who returned to the site of the sighting with the three men Saturday. They used a dog trained to track a bear and deer, but found no physical evidence to verify the presence of such a creature, Horn said. They very obviously did see something, but we were unable to come up with anything at all other than their belief in what they saw said horn the incident is the first report in several years of a bigfoot sighting in the northern sierras a similar creature was reported about 10 years ago in nevada county near the western sierra county line seekers of truth fellow zenyetians welcome once again to another story straight from the Bigfoot Vault. It is I, Michael Merchant, your host. Your host for the show. This is 
a peculiar story on a couple fronts. For one, they don't call it a wild man, they call it a monster animal. And they claim to have shot and killed two of them, which was not duplicated until Justin Smeha claims to have shot two as well. All right, let's get to the story. The Galveston Daily News, Tuesday, June the 11th, 1889. A monster animal. He was seven feet high, covered with hair, and walked erect. During the time the Indians were in the south, a hunting party established a camp east of Tugagalo River in his, what is now Okanee country. South Carolina, says the Clarksville Advertiser. One day they all went hunting, leaving a deer they had killed the evening previous at the camp. At night, when the Indians returned to camp, the deer was gone, and the next day the same thing was repeated when they concluded to leave an old Indian to guard the camp and see what went with their deer. That day the old Indian saw a monster animal come and carry off the deer and was afraid to make any attempt to kill the monster which was about seven feet high and walked erect like a man, hairy all over and its mouth was in its chin and great claws on the fingers and toes. The next day all seven of the Indians stayed at the camp and as usual the monster came, gathered up the deer and started off. When one of them fired at it, the ball taking effect in the back, the animal dropped the deer and turned and started towards them. When the other six poured a volley into its breast and it fell dead. About three hours after that the Indians heard a noise like someone hallooing about a mile distance. Quote, Yahoo! 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 End quote. The Indians left the camp and called on a posse for protection. When a party of whites on horses with all the dogs they could get went in search of the other animal and found it. It was like the one the Indians killed and putting the dogs after it when the men appeared in sight the animal would run but it could whip every dog they could get after it. The party pursued it to the river and at two jumps it went across the river over into Habistan County and was shot by a party soon after it crossed the river. What is peculiar about this story is the seeming mix of uh, you know known behaviors, known reports, then added to it the fact that, that they killed this thing. There was no follow-up that I'm aware of. Uh, you know, they didn't do anything with the bodies. Seems kind of odd, like maybe the author, maybe someone along the line, somebody added that. But the report of the vocalization, we have a lot of eyewitnesses telling us that this phenomenon generates that, that type of, uh, you know, sound. And, and we've actually recorded that sound as well. The description is spot on, seven feet high, covered in hair. But it's it's weird that its eyes, uh, or I mean its mouth, was in its chin. What what the hell is that all about? And the, these Indians were really uh, lucky hunters if they were getting a deer a day. I don't know. I don't know what to make of this story. What do you guys think? Do you think it's completely fabricated? Do you think it is completely true? Or do you think maybe it's it's a mix of of truth and fiction and and if it is what parts do you think are true and what parts are fiction I suppose this is one of the real problems with this phenomenon is you know uh, getting as they as they say the chaff from the wheat to to filter out and, and try to figure out what is the the real data alright guys thanks a lot for watching leave your comments down below 
This report comes out of Pennsylvania, 2012, just a few years ago. Police officers were dispatched for a report of criminal mischief. The complainant reported that his 1973 Dodge Winnebago taillights and windows were smashed out. Prior to these incidents, the victim related that he saw a Bigfoot in the area of his motorhome. The actor, slash Bigfoot, is described as very large, brown in color, and walks somewhat hunched over. After seeing the aforementioned Bigfoot, the victim turned on the outside lights to his motorhome. And upon doing so, the Bigfoot began throwing rocks at the light to prevent discovery. The victim was unable to describe whether the Bigfoot was hairy. We'll look at another police report and take note of the underlying tone of ridicule. I believe this report is out of Connecticut. It states North America. The complainant called and reported that the victim had just seen Bigfoot. The complainant stated that the subject was seen by the railroad tracks in the rear of the 9th Street area. The complainant stated that while on the victim's way back into the village of Waterford, she saw a large creature in the area that growled at her. The victim then fled. Officers Norton Japor dispatched to the area. The officer stated that the victim saw a large hairy creature that she believes to be Bigfoot. Officers reported out in the area looking for the said creature. At 048 hours, the officer stated that the subject is gone out of the area and that he must have gone back to his cave. 4392 resumed patrol. We'll finish this up with a fairly old report from 1818. The Appalachicola Gazette states that the habituation of some unknown animal has just been discovered in the upper parts of that city which has given rise to many strange conjectures. The animal at the time of the discovery was in it, but made its escape. It is said by those who saw it to resemble somewhat the baboon, and from the size of the nest it is judged to be five feet in height, and of a carnivorous description, as many bones were found about the premise. The nest was nicely made, of loose cotton between several bales. What the hell is going on here? A five foot tall baboon? That doesn't really make a lot of sense. And I mean, are people just losing? They always go back to like, oh, it's an escaped wild animal. Who Who's keeping these wild animals? They're not reporting it to anybody? Oh, 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 by the way, my five foot tall giant baboon escaped. Yeah, I'd kind of like to have him back. They're either described as escaped animals or hermits that somehow or another have now grown shaggy coats of fur like a bear. Very peculiar stories, I think you would agree. There is a running theme of ridicule towards witnesses reporting the truth, reporting what they've experienced. 